right, let's get those state outlines on there. How about some county outlines? No, that's probably not going to work. So this afternoon, we do have some interesting weather in the southeastern U.S. You can see some rotation in the cloud field. Looks like it's centered about right here. And that's indicative of cyclonic rotation, possibly a mesoscale vortex or even a larger synoptic scale system. We'll take a look at the charts and see what's going on. Also, a new frontal system moving through the central Rockies, the Great Basin area. And you can see some unstable looking cloud fields up there in Montana and Idaho. Let's take a look at that surface map. Well, we do have a weak low pressure area in western Georgia, 10, 11 millibars on that, and a lot of storm and shower activity. However, it's starting to look like spring. Lots of 70s and 80s across much of the central U.S. 81 degrees there at DFW, 82 at San Antonio, and 80 at Midland. So we are changing seasons. However, a new weather system out there in Arizona. And you can see the telltale northwest winds. A lot of times these systems can be very difficult to find, but... This is a very clear indication of one. The San Joaquin Valley blowing northwest, and even down in the Colorado River Basin, northwest winds. And sometimes that can be even more important than the air temperatures. And some more cold air coming in the northern plains, 40s and 50s, which is definitely on the mild side. Let's check out the Pacific. High pressure forming a ridge all the way up into the Pacific Northwest where it is a cool but fair day. And then up in Alaska, another deep system in the Gulf of Alaska. And bringing in some cold air advection behind that. Snow showers and very cold temperatures down to the single digits and teens in the Aleutians. Northern Canada still looking kind of cold. Most of that air is heading out into the Labrador Sea, Baffin Island, and Quebec. So we're not going to really see too much of that. And just the usual hodgepodge of strong weather systems out there south of Greenland. Well, let's talk a little bit about the upper air patterns. One thing that we're looking for here is vertical motion and the two components of that, that's going to be temperature advection in the lower troposphere. And the other term is differential vorticity advection, which gives us an idea of how mass is being exchanged in the vertical. This is the low-level temperature advection field, and this is showing us that we have cold air advection and downward motion in these areas right here, and upward motion is indicated right there. And you can kind of see that in the height fields. We've got the sea level pressure here. We've got the thickness, which you see on the opening maps. And that implies that the air is flowing like this, roughly, and bringing that cold air down. And there's the differential vorticity advection. This is indicating downward motion across California and upward motion across New Mexico in the Four Corners area. And if you look at the 500 millibar heights, which is going to be these black lines, you'll see a trough right here. That's a mid-level trough. And you also notice that the downward motion is on the back side. The upward motion is on the other side, which is exactly what you would expect with upper level troughs. So, and putting all that together, differential vorticity advection and thermal advection, that gives us our Q vector field, the implied motion in the atmosphere, so yeah, there's sort of a trough in here. Upward motion concentrated in the Four Corners area and downward motion across Southern California. You can see a similar thing happen in the Southeast U.S. Most of the upward motion is focused on Georgia. And remember that this upward motion does not trigger thunderstorms. What it does is it prepares the environment and increases the lapse rates, removes the cap, and that's how you get thunderstorms when you add a bit of heating, a little bit of lift along a boundary, 
and you've got a great environment for cells to go up right there. Not so much out there in Mississippi that would indicate cap strengthening and weakening lapse rates. And indeed, you look at what we have here, most of the intense convection is in eastern Alabama and Georgia. The stuff out there in Mississippi, this is all stratified. That's all flat stratocumulus. It's actually cumulus that's rising and then spreading out, maybe up at about 5,000 feet, 6,000 feet or so, and just giving them kind of a cloudy day. So, yeah, not much rain out to the west. So the upper level charts compare fairly well with the satellite. And of course, we got to check things out there in the Four Corners area. Yeah, lots of cumuliform clouds. And then on the other side where we have the downward vertical motion, clear skies in the Mojave Desert. The turbulent dynamic weather does show very well on that map. But why isn't there any significant precip? Well, look at those dew points. Dew points are in the teens and 20s, and even 7 degrees there at Albuquerque. That's very dry air. Now, sometimes you can get some elevated storms if you get enough forcing there in the mid-levels, but I think that probably is what's happening to a certain extent. Probably a lot of verga and threatening weather, maybe some showers on the higher elevations, but just not much in the lower levels. And out there in Texas, deep southerly flow, but not much moisture working its way north. Starting to see some 50s there around Victoria, Brownsville, but only 33 at Laredo, 28 at Catula, and 30s up to DFW. So this is very, very early in the moisture return phase. And we're probably starting to get into that pattern where we have cyclogenesis out there in the panhandles. Yeah, there it is. So are we going to get any moisture? Well, we can see that, yeah, obviously we do by Thursday evening. But let's check out that moisture. For that, we go to the 925 millibar dew point. That's my personal favorite. You can see that dry return flow. It looks like it's been eroded somewhat by this offshore component from Houston eastward. Looks like the transition line is right around there. Got southerly winds on that side, north on the other, and eventually that shifts eastward, and we start seeing a modest low level jet getting established. It starts out dry, in fact, there's very dry air off Corpus Christi tonight, but that moisture is lurking down in Mexico, and there it is coming up by tomorrow morning into South Texas and into the Dallas area by Thursday, tomorrow. So I think we are going to have that dry line start to set up. That's going to be the dry line at 925. And we can also see the whitish colors in the West Texas area. That's going to be that Canadian front. The atmosphere is a little bit more moist than it is coming from Arizona, where we have the dry plateau air feeding into the Big Bend area and this notch up there near Dallas. So the fronts are going to look somewhat like that, maybe a warm front through the Red River area, and then a dry line extending south. So it will be kind of a dynamic weather day for tomorrow. So from the Storm Prediction Center, here's what we have. This twisting in the southeastern U.S. that's suggesting, of course, a low-pressure center and some of the moisture advecting around the east side. And then for tomorrow, things light up in Texas, slight risk all the way out towards Louisiana and Mississippi. Now, I've not looked at any of these products yet. I do see that the initiation area probably right there close to that surface low, and this is also indicating that probably there's a substantial amount of capping down to the south. Remember, we saw that air from Arizona spreading eastward, and that usually is accompanied by high 700 millibar temperatures, which means cap strengthening. 
And then the other part, when I see a pattern like this, I start thinking maybe a derecho, but I don't think that's going to be the case for tomorrow. And then we take a look at the text discussion. So this paragraph right here focuses mostly on the afternoon and evening initiation. Looks like moisture may be a bit of a problem. Steep mid-level lapse rates, but the actual instability not that great. And you can see the main threats here, large hail and damaging wind gusts. And this is going to be for the overnight hours in Louisiana and Mississippi. It appears it's not a derecho. Looks like just substantial warm advection, moisture flowing northward, a low-level jet. And it looks like as it moves eastward, maybe some enhancement towards the end of the period for tornadoes. And really, a good tool to use to size things up is the supercell composite. There we go. Max heating tomorrow. A cluster of storms probably from Oklahoma City, Ada, Ardmore down I-35 to Fort Worth, and maybe out west of Hillsboro. Maybe some storms going up there. You can see that the ingredients kind of fizzle out after dark. We lose the heating. Now with that synoptic scale lift, the forcing, that should all still be going. So things will translate eastward. And then for max heating tomorrow, doesn't look like a whole lot, but we are focused on southern Alabama. And then by Saturday, some residual stuff along the coast, and then it looks like kind of a nice weekend. Yeah, look at that in the Gulf. That appears to be more moisture coming north, and things are a little bit more unstable for Monday. Yep, it's that time of the year. So we've talked a lot about Texas. Let's look at the rest of the country. That little low we talked about there in Georgia right now, you can see some cold air damming in the Carolinas. That's enhancing the low-level vertical motion field. Got that front kind of in here. The southerly flow rides over the top of that front. You get the isentropic lift and enhancement of convection out there in northeast Georgia and the Carolinas. Anyway, that'll move to the east tomorrow, and then we're looking at Texas there. That's going to be max heating. Definite potential for storms there north of Dallas, and then some weaker stuff northwest of Oklahoma City. That's going to be mostly undercut by the front. Anyway, things move to the northeast. Pretty good MCS at daybreak Friday in Alabama, and that continues moving eastward through the day. So we may see some good storm prospects actually in Georgia. So I'm wondering, why did that not show up very well on the supercell composite? Let's go to max heating Friday. Yeah, that's kind of tricky because the MCS is about like that. Not too sure what's going on. The best way to solve that is to bring up the soundings and kind of look at things. Yeah, I guess the air mass out further west could be primed, but that, that's a ways out. We're not going to worry too much about that. Southern Georgia, conditionally unstable. So elsewhere around the country, a deep low in Illinois. Front moving through that area, some wraparound snow in Milwaukee, Madison, and Rockford moving into Chicago by early Saturday. And you can see the dominance of liquid precip all the way into Quebec. Don't have any snow there in New York or Northeast US, so that's another sign that we are getting later in the season. Here comes our next system through the Rockies on Monday. Pressure falls in New Mexico. Storms pretty far west out there around Midland. Hobbs and Tucumcari. That's going to be overnight, so I think we've probably got early cap erosion going on. And we get this MCS moving northeast during the day, so stormy through much of the south central U.S. Some snow back there in Colorado, and everything moves eastward. You can check out your favorite area there to see what's going on Thursday, and then Friday looking like that. 
and quite a bit of snow and cold air well up to the north. So maybe one last push of cold air. Yeah, that's coming a little bit far south. 540 line still around Wichita, so that'll probably drop our highs into the 40s and 50s across Texas, Oklahoma. And then colder air up in the Great Lakes. And really, that's about all I got. Oh yeah, we should take a look at Ukraine. Got that war going on there, and the weather is definitely a significant factor. Back in the 1940s, the weather bogged down Nazi Germany. Many divisions got a lot of their equipment stuck in the mud, and there's the possibility for this to occur again with all the mechanized infantry that's in Ukraine. So you can see starting out, we get this cold push of air into eastern Ukraine, temperatures down to minus 10 Celsius, which is in the teens Fahrenheit. That's going to be tonight. Then a very gradual warm up. The cold air sticks around eastern part of the country, mostly below freezing during the day, very warm out to the west, approaching the 40s. But by the weekend, we get a substantial warm up. There's how it looks on Monday, starting to see 50s in some parts out west. Yep, well into the 50s around Lviv. Kiev still in around 50. And it gets even warmer through the rest of next week. So really, it's a critical time for the Russian military in Ukraine. This is the last week that the ground will be assured of being frozen. And the other factor, of course, is precip. So we'll look at the QPFs. Fairly dry since most of the low-level flow is from the north. The humid flow from the Black Sea and the mid-levels, that's pretty much gone. So it's going to be dry over the next week or so. And I don't see any significant precip coming into that area during the period. Yeah, some problems there about 10 days from now. And eventually those notorious spring rains will arrive. And that's all I got for today. I'll leave you with some footage from my cousin Greg Payne, who's contributing some drone footage now. This is in the Texas Hill Country, west and northwest of San Antonio. So enjoy. Take care, and we will talk to you on Friday. Bye-bye.